Insurance doesn't have to be a headache. Hodinkee Insurance is the fastest and easiest way to protect the watches you love. So, what are you waiting for? Sign up today. People will often say of a famous person that they're a person who needs no introduction, and if there's a watch that doesn't need an introduction, it's definitely the Royal Oak. It's one of the best known, if not the best known, luxury watches in the world. The first stainless steel luxury sports watch ever when it was introduced in 1972, and the forefather of an entire genre of watches without which modern watchmaking would not be what it is today. We're gonna to get into the past, present, and future of the Royal Oak right now on Royal Oak Reference Points. For volume 10 of the Hodinkee magazine, I did something I've never done before, which is write a reference points article on the Royal Oak. And uh, the reason that I haven't done it before is because it's pretty difficult to do. There have been hundreds of different variations over the years. They came in uh, all shapes and sizes, many different dial colors, many different dial variations. But because there are so many Royal Oak references, we decided that we would not talk about the complicated watches. We decided instead that we would focus on uh, the Royal Oak in its purest form, which is a time-only watch with date. And what we're gonna see is that while it may seem as if the Royal Oak has actually changed very little over the years, uh, there have actually been significant alterations in the design, and each major variation of the Royal Oak, which is what we're gonna look at, has its own character. Now, we've said that there were literally hundreds of different Royal Oak models, and that's true, but they all trace their lineage back to one extremely famous person in the watch world, this uh, soulful-eyed gentleman, Mr. Gerald Genta. And uh, the interesting thing about Genta's uh, design effort was he got the brief uh, to design the Royal Oak from AP's president, Georges Golay, and he uh, executed the design in one night. And uh, one of the interesting things about the initial design is that um, it has all of the design elements which you would associate with the Royal Oak. So we have, uh, of course, the octagonal bezel. Uh, we have the uh, bathtub or binoir shaped hands and markers. Uh, and we have the bolts in the bezel with screw slots cut into them. The other major design feature of the Royal Oak is that it has a uh, truly integrated steel bracelet. Now, it's not the first watch to be created with an integrated metal bracelet, however, at the time, it was a revolutionary design because there really had been nothing like it before. And uh, this decision to treat stainless steel as a luxury material is, uh, I think, more than anything else, what makes the Royal Oak uh, a unique design. The very first Royal Oak ever was introduced in 1972, and it's the reference 5402. The design was done in 1971. The watch was actually introduced at Basel World in uh, 1972. Now, depending on which account you listen to or read about, uh, the Royal Oak was either a commercial flop or a moderate success when it was first introduced. Martin Verley, uh, who's now retired, but who used to run the uh, AP Museum, uh, said that people were coming up to their booth in Basel World and taking a look at uh, this watch, which is now one of the most famous, most expensive, and most well-known watches in the world. Uh, they were looking at it and they were saying, oh, marvelous, congratulations. He said they were saying, marvelous, congratulations. And then they were going around the corner and saying they'll be out of business in uh, two months. Clearly, the Royal Oak has been pretty good for business. But it is true that it took a little while for it to find uh, traction. Now, you have to remember, before the Royal Oak, before the 5402, Audemars Piguet was known as, for two things. It was known for manufacturing very elegant, ultra-thin watches, and it was also known for making very, very, very complicated watches. Basically, all of the design features that we see in uh, modern Royal Oaks are present in this watch, with some variations in things like typeface, the size of the engraving on the dial. We have the hexagonal crown, the octagonal bezel, and this uh, very, very beautifully executed integrated stainless steel bracelet. The process of manufacturing the watch was quite difficult because polishing stainless steel to this level had never really been done before, certainly not by the watchmaking industry. One beautiful detail, for example, is the uh, corner of the case of the original 5402 and uh, every subsequent Royal Oak. Uh, there's this beautifully executed transition between these quite complex brushed and polished surfaces. And uh, it's one of the things that's easy to miss, but which lends great character to the watch. The 5402 represented a dramatic alteration in the direction that the company was taking in its design efforts. It was revolutionary for the watch industry, but uh, I think it's worth remembering that in 1972, it was pretty revolutionary for Audemars Piguet as well. 
One of the interesting things about the Royal Oak 5402, the very first, is that at 39 millimeters, it was actually kind of a large watch for its time. It limited the appeal of the original Royal Oak uh, in the broader market. So, Audemars Piguet made the obvious decision, which is they decided to do a smaller Royal Oak. The Royal Oak II was designed in 1976 by Jacqueline Dimier. It was actually the very first Royal Oak uh, designed by someone other than Gerald Genta. And the reason for this is because the Genta by then was no longer working with AP. Now, it looks like this was just a matter of shrinking down the watch to 29 millimeters in diameter, but this actually might be a little bit more difficult than you think. And uh, part of the reason that Jacqueline Dimier is as respected as she is, is because she actually managed uh, in 1976 to take Genta's design, reduce the size dramatically by 10 millimeters down to 29 millimeters, and at the same time, give us a watch that had the same visual impact, the same beauty, and the same aesthetic impact as the original 5402. We didn't really start to see the Royal Oak open up to a broader audience until uh, the reference 4100 watches were introduced in 1977, also designed by Jacqueline Dimier. It was the first of the very successful so-called mid-size Royal Oaks. It was introduced in a 35 millimeter case. 36 millimeter cases were introduced in 1983. It was the first Royal Oak to have a center seconds hand. And this was really the beginning of the Royal Oak starting to reach a broader audience. At 29 millimeters, uh, the Royal Oak II was probably perceived, at least in some quarters, as a ladies' watch. At 35 and 36 millimeters, however, you had a watch which really fit the tastes of the time. And this was the beginning of the Royal Oak starting to make inroads uh, into a, a much wider audience than it had ever achieved with a 39 millimeter size or a 29 millimeter size. So we start to see the design language beginning to diversify, and we also start to see the mechanical language start to diversify at the same time. Now, the 4100 series of watches were the first move by Audemars Piguet into producing mid-size Royal Oaks for a larger market. Um, but if the 4100 led the charge, it's the 14,000 series of watches which uh, really broke the dam. The 14,000 series of watches were made in a huge, huge variety. Audemars Piguet says from 1983 on, more than 50 different models. Uh, they were made in steel, they were made in gold, they were made in two-tone. There was even one in quartz made in tantalum and steel. Um, they had an enormous variety of dials. And the watches were sold uh, by AP up until 2006. And uh, they're popular with collectors for two reasons. One is that there's enough of them that you can still actually collect them, unlike uh, jumbos, which have become, for most collectors, uh, extremely expensive. And uh, there's also a huge variety of them. So you put those in the 4100 series together and uh, you could be a very happy Royal Oak collector without ever having to spend big on a jumbo. Now, uh, 1992 was an incredibly important year for the Royal Oak. It was the 20th anniversary and uh, AP decided to mark the 20th anniversary by producing what I think is one of the most beautiful uh, Royal Oaks ever made. It's the 14802 20th anniversary watch. And uh, it was the very first Royal Oak, which actually had a display back and it allowed you to see uh, for the first time uh, what I think is one of the most beautiful movements ever made. It's the uh, caliber 2121. And the caliber 2121 was when it was introduced, the thinnest full rotor automatic watch in the world. It is still the thinnest full rotor automatic uh, movement in the world. And um, I mean, just look at it. You know, I mean, if you're sensitive to uh, beauty and mechanical objects, it's kind of hard not to fall in love. Uh, one of the most interesting features of the watch is uh, the construction of the automatic winding system. Uh, you can see the automatic winding rotor here. And uh, the rotor actually runs on a ring, which is supported by four ruby rollers uh, at the edge of the movement plate. For a movement that's so thin, it's actually surprisingly robust and surprisingly reliable. I don't think I've ever seen a more beautiful self-winding movement. Now, uh, we said that the 14,000 series was uh, sold by AP up until 2006, and by 2006, uh, something interesting had happened. Uh, something called in-house was starting to become a big deal. And uh, Audemars Piguet had uh, not been using in-house movements in the mid-size series at all. They'd been using movements sourced uh, from Gégé Lacoche. Perfectly fine movements, perfectly appropriate for the watch. But uh, in luxury watchmaking, what people wanted was uh, for everything to come from the same manufacturer and realistically or not, uh, to be made under the same roof. And uh, for that reason, Audemars Piguet introduced uh, the 15,000 series of watches with, for the first time, 
a completely in-house automatic movement from Audemars Piguet. The 15,000 series looks, for all intents and purposes, like pretty much every other Royal Oak. You have the same octagonal bezel. You have the same hexagonal pseudo screws holding the bezel down, the same bathtub shaped hands. You've got the same beautiful integrated stainless steel bracelet, the same crown. Very, very difficult to tell from the front that this is a different watch from any preceding series of Royal Oaks. Uh, but if you turn them around, what you will see is uh, the caliber 3120, which was AP's first in-house movement. It was designed to be robust, reliable, accurate, uh, easy to service. And uh, for the first time with the 15,000 series, which AP began to produce in 2005, collectors, enthusiasts, and connoisseurs had what they hoped for from AP, which was an in-house, truly in-house automatic movement. Now the 1992 uh, 20th anniversary Royal Oaks are uh, very, very beautiful, very expensive to collect. And they were not obviously the last jumbos that Audemars Piguet was going to make. The 14802 was uh, followed by two more 15,000 series watches. And these were uh, the 15,002 and the 15202. They have basically all of the attributes that you would expect and hope for from a jumbo. The same 39 millimeter size, we see here in the photograph the same beautiful uh, blue petite tapisserie dial that we saw in the original uh, 5402s from 1972. And uh, they're just very, very attractive watches. Um, this is a relatively rare reference. They're running at about 100,000 plus on the current market. Uh, and these have a solid case back. Uh, so um, unlike the uh, anniversary model, you can't actually see the movement. Still, every inch of Royal Oak. The 15,002 was followed by the 15202. And uh, the 15202 was uh, the last, and I say this with a certain amount of sadness, it was the last Jumba to actually use uh, the caliber 2120 movement. Gorgeous watch, really nothing much to distinguish it from the uh, 15,002. Uh, just a classic Jumbo with a classic movement. But the caliber 2121 at this point is a kind of starting to show its age. I mean, again, I think that it is amazing watchmaking content. I think it's an absolutely beautiful movement. And I think it made the um, all of the jumbo models up until the 15202 is uh, discontinued, um, something really, really special. But the fact is, it's a movement that was designed in 1967. Uh, it's a little fussy to service. It's probably not as accurate, nor as reliable as uh, a lot of modern watch collectors would expect. Uh, for that reason, uh, in 2022, Audemars Piguet decided to discontinue the 15202. They decided to discontinue the caliber 2121, and they introduced a brand new movement in a brand new Royal Oak, probably the biggest change in the jumbo since it was first introduced in 1972. And that watch is the 16202. Now, uh, the 16202 does have some small design changes from earlier versions of the Jumbo. You have the AP logo down at six o'clock. We have a double index up at 12 o'clock. But in most other respects, it's virtually identical to a Jumbo from uh, 1972. But it's when you turn it over that you really know that um, it's new day for AP and a new day for the Jumbo. And what we have is uh, the caliber 7121. It gives the impression immediately of being a more robust and a, certainly a thoroughly rationalized modern movement. It's pretty fantastic that AP was able to create uh, an all new, very thin automatic movement that is marginally thicker than the 2121, but which actually fits into a Royal Oak Jumbo case of exactly the same size. The only slightly controversial part of the design of the movement is the uh, 50th anniversary open worked rotor. People seem to have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with the 50th anniversary numbers. Um, it looks a little, I don't know, modern perhaps for a watch that lives so much in, it, in its history as the Royal Oak. Uh, but it is, I think, also symbolic of um, something that's more reliable, with something that's more robust, and something that represents a look towards the future as much as it does reverence for the past. Hopefully, if you've uh, gotten to this point, you agree with me that the Royal Oak is an extremely interesting watch, but it's an interesting watch for some unexpected reasons. What it did was it took steel and elevated it to the level of a luxury material. And while this had been done before in design, certainly it had never really been done in watchmaking and in watch design before. The other fascinating thing to me about the design of the Royal Oak is the way in which it takes very sort of technical, aggressive, 
mechanical solution focused design elements and turns them into design elements. It is a very, very, very clever use by the designer and by Audemars Piguet of aspects of watchmaking that look technical and in some cases were never meant to be seen. I mean, visible large bolts holding the vessel down. I mean, who does that? It is something that truly had not been done before in watchmaking. And it's one of the things I think that has made the Royal Oak as relevant, as interesting, and as beautiful a watch today as it was in 1972.